Okay. Hey, um, just wanted to see if there's any questions first over last week's um, assignments for you guys, because um, there was a few that um, didn't finish all the way through. So I, I wanted to go ahead and start with that because we've been in and like way on the dot here. So we probably need to start with that so you guys feel like you're kind of caught up here. So some of you anyway. So um, last week we um, we talked about um, the poem Sympathy. And um, Okay. So, and then we, I left you off at finishing up um, Caged Bird and Emily Dickinson's poem. Okay. So, probably need to, I want to, I guess, first start out with, um, Cage bird to see if there are any questions that we need to answer. You guys just open up and let me know. And I want to go through and just discuss it a little bit. And then if there's any questions, just yell it out. Okay. So uh, let me see if this is the right one. Okay. Yeah, there was just four questions and they were mostly uh, dealing with comparing and contrasting those two poems. So We go okay okay so <clears throat> uh, number one was uh, contrast a life of a free bird in stanza one of Angelo's poem with a life of the cage bird in Dunbar's poem well Dunbar's poem was a little bit more um, oh he, he was it was more negative towards the cage I mean he was all he was he always went back to being in a cage and how it felt and all the, you know the bruises and the brutality <clears throat> where Angelo's poem in stanza one was actually very positive. Um, what a free bird um, sees and hears and smells and how exciting it is to be free. Um, it's a lot about, about that. If, if you go back to that poem, that first stanza where a free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and clips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. So if you can see that, I mean, lots of imagery there used and it's very positive energy, you know, um, positive words that's used to describe what a, what being free is actually feels like. Okay. So where Dunbar was a little bit more brutal in when he, he was more on the side of a caged bird and how it always, you know, out feels. Not really looking so much at how it actually feels to be free, so. And that could be like the female, male perspective because it's really more or less the same type of theme going on, but where there are different viewpoints of being a, a slave, okay. And then Angelo goes into how it feels to be caged in the second stanza where it gets very, very much more negative connotative words. Okay. Um, there. So, um, oops, wrong one. Did the right thing up here. Okay. All right. So, number one, any questions out there you guys want to? Go over anything we good with, with that one awesome Brielle thank you for your participation anybody else out there Brittany how about you good <laughs> thumbs up awesome Brandy Michael Tyler anything else okay all right, just shout out guys, okay? This is the time to shout out those questions and see if we can go over those. So number two, how does the free bird and the cage bird symbolize conditions faced by different groups of people? Okay, and you guys have done all your, your historical 
you know, in your history classes and know that, you know, how it feels to be, uh, I mean, you don't know how it feels in some cases, but some, some of you guys know how it feels to be caged up to, a, a, to an extent, okay? Um, but, you know, when we, when we think of people that have been deprived of their freedoms, okay, or certain opportunities um, that's out there because maybe that their race or gender, you know, that's where that comes in, you know, how, what kind of, it, you know, and being a, uh, a free bird, you know, you're free to do whatever you want just because maybe you're, uh, you're white or you're a male or you're rich or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Or you're a criminal. <laughs> well, in a cage bird, <laughs> you don't have those opportunities, do you? You're a criminal, perhaps, maybe, and a lot of criminals are criminals because they live in poverty and never have been given that chance to actually, you know, be free and have those opportunities. Sometimes growing up in those conditions um, limits, limits how much you can do. So there's a lot of different features to that other than just race and gender. It's your, you know, your class, how much money you have, how short you are. If you, you know, there's all kinds of different things that go correlate with those conditions of how actually free you feel. So, <clears throat> um, number three, explain what the sky symbolizes in the last line of the poem and why the sky is an appropriate symbol. <clears throat> okay, so if you go down to uh, on the right one. Mm. The sky symbolizes the last line of the poem. Okay. So the cage bird sings with a fearful trill and things unknown but long to still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. Okay, so. Um, there was something that mentioned sky and it was like the last line of a couple stanzas up. Um, you got it right here. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn and the names of the sky has known. You guys see that how the, the fat worms, how birds, you know, if you're free, you can have like you're out there to get those fat worms. The dawn brings you in. You're out there with the trees and the winds and the breeze. See all those positive connotation words in there? And he names the sky his own. So the sky is what in that actual stanza? What is the sky to this bird? Freedom. Yep. Okay. And it's, he doesn't have all those limitations, right? He can get all those fat worms he wants out there, right? He can go in any tree that he wants to, feel any breeze that he wants, and there's no limitations. So it, yes, it's, it actually symbolizes that freedom and that he just doesn't have those limitations. Like, you know, everybody has some limitations, no matter who they are, but that's what he's symbolizing there. Yep. Okay. The cage bird is an extended metaphor for what? Anybody know what that one might be? What's in an extended metaphor for what? Remember, extended metaphor is throughout the poem. And what is it actually a metaphorically speaking of? Uh, slavery? Yep, pretty much. Okay. Being caged up could be slavery, could be just, you know, being in a, a place where you just don't have any freedoms at all. Okay, questions on that, guys? Anything you want to discuss there? Um, I thought we weren't supposed to do the Emily Dickinson poem till this week. You did not have to. I, I kind of wanted you guys to get through some of that and see how you did. That way we're just going to, because I'm not going to go through every little point of it, but I certainly did not 
if I put a grade in, it's just because some of you hadn't done the caged bird and some of you hadn't done sympathy. So I thought, well, I better put a grade in just so some of you would kind of have an idea where you're at. So maybe you need to get started on those last two poems. Because as you know, you know, you get behind on stuff, then it's for it, you know, terrific trying to catch up. So I don't want you guys doing, doing that, trying to catch up and ugh, that's yuck. So, all right, so that's why I put a grade in. And if I didn't, so when you finish this, if you have finished, great. You're, I mean, your grade probably reflects if you did. And it, your grade probably reflects if you didn't. But I am, uh, but I'll be going back and uh, changing some of your grades when you do finish those, this one, okay? So this poem, all right, has to do, Emily Dickinson, of course, is known as being a, Kind of a reclusive author. You know what a recluse is? Kind of write it. Avoiding, avoiding kind of to yourself. All right, keeping to yourself, avoiding people. All right, that's kind of what Emily, she, that's how she actually lived her life. And where she wrote her greatest poetry was, you know, actually in her house and without seeing people or being out in public at all. So it's, it's amazing how she could write and what she could write about being in such an enclosed place. I mean, it's not like she lived that way her whole life, but when she wrote her greatest poetry, that's how it was. Um, this one's called, We Never Know How High We Are. Now, if you, if you got it, if you understood like on Cage Bird and Sympathy, you know, that, that bird or, you know, that person, you know, so wanted to get out to that freedom and just see what it, and, and live those conditions to be free and, and do anything that he wants or she wants because those limitations are gone, you know, those restraints are gone and we can just go. On this one, a little bit different twist um, on, the, on the freedom. And it's, you know, if, you know and if this one's talking about even though we have the freedom, a lot of us are more or less kind of scared you know, or, you know, a little bit nervous about actually grasping hold of things that we probably could do, right? Um, you know, and, you know, maybe you always wanted to be uh, the president of your, of your school type of thing, and you know you could do it, but you just don't feel, you don't have that confidence in yourself to really follow through with that plan. And that's kind of what this is. Even though we do have those freedoms, sometimes we just don't believe in ourselves. We don't, we don't realize that we can touch those skies and we can get out there and do whatever we want, you know, outside the norm, okay? But we just fear that. Uh, we just fear that, and that where she talks about where we fear that king, that person, that intimidator, all right, in front of us. Some, we have, we all have that lack of confidence in some areas and, and that holds us back in some of our dreams. So it's a little bit different twist on the, the freedom scale, but it's still essentially um, talking about if we were free, then now what? So, so we never know how high we are till we are asked to rise. And then if we are true to plan, our statues touch the sky. Stature, you know, like how you know, statues touch the sky. You know, how high can we reach if we really, really, really want it, okay? The heroism we recite. So we talk, you know, those people that talk the talk, but they don't do the do <laughs> because they really do lack that confidence in themselves. So the heroism we recite would be a normal thing that our, did not ourselves the Cubist warp for fear to be king. Okay, Cubist is more or less like a, a measurement, um, like um, in ancient times from your, like your finger to your elbow, it's like a measurement and how it's bent. So our stature, our, our, our whole, you know, confidence level is always bent up because we just don't believe in ourselves because we are, we're intimidated by this and this and this or whatever it might be. We have those intimidations in our lives to capture, capture what our dreams are holding for us. But, so that's what that, that more or less is um, discussing there. Um, the words there, a little bit tricky. I mean, if you read it through a couple, three, four times, you're like, I kind of get it, but like, ah. So, 
You might have any questions over that poem or what it means. All good to go there. So just yell at me because I'm not, when I have my screen open, I'm not very good at seeing people's reactions. And I wish you guys would show your faces. Okay. Hannah's always showing her face. It's always like, see? <laughs> All right, so going on. So um, talks about uh, what, if anything, has ever made you. So this is your own answer, okay? There's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just helping you feel, figure out and uh, going to back to these poems, what has ever made you feel like a caged bird? Like, you know, what do you think that the freedoms are not there for you? You know, do you think there's limitations and what experiences have you had? You know, I know when you guys go from elementary to middle school and, and high school, the biggest thing I hear like, oh my gosh, finally high school, we have some freedoms. <laughs> we can move around a little bit now without having our hand held. <laughs> so I know you guys have experienced that. Some of you know that, you know, in elementary school, some of, some of the kids need their hand held and some, you know, we're all good to go. But it's just how it is. It's human beings. We're all individual. So you're just supposed to give an example of how you might have felt like a cage bird. And I know probably you've been grounded a few times, possibly, in your life. So you might have put that answer down. Okay. I know that some of you had to experience this uh, COVID and you know that we're staying home all the time and couldn't go outside even some at some points during this deal and you probably really felt like a caged bird. So very limited on what you could do and still are. We're still very limited on what we can do. So, all right, number two, any questions? Good to go there, guys. Yeah. What discovery does the speaker make in each of the poems? Okay, what discovery? Anybody answer that one for us? You know, it's all talking about if you have that, if you know what it's like to be caged up or, you know, you have those limitations um, because of whatever it might be, you know, that all these poems are actually kind of discussing those, how it feels to be limited or caged up, so to speak. Okay. So that's kind of the discovery there made. Like they're all just like discussing how they're caged up. Even in the, the last poem of Dickinson's, you know, this person still feels caged up because they don't have the confidence to go out there and, and follow their dreams. So they still feel limited. Okay. So all that, that, those themes kind of run across in all those poems of how it feels to be caged, caged up. Um, also in like the, the caged bird by Angelo, she's more like how it, like she's going out there and how it feels really to have that freedom and what it looks like, what it smells like. So if you can do it, if you can break those restraints, you know, She's actually discussing the more positive of freedom if you can break through. So, any questions on two? All good to go? I know some of you have finished it up and some of you did a great job on this. So, if you guys want to, those of you who finished it up, please add what you feel is uh, an appropriate good answer. Okay? Because some of you had great answers on this. So, What does a cage bird want to do? What's he want to do? Be free. What's he, yeah, he's got these bars right in front of him, right? He wants to break these bars and get out there. Be free. Of what does the free bird in Angelo's poem think? Anybody get that one? What do you think about that? Remember it talked about, remember it talked about, um, 
Here it is. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds of soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on the dawn br bright lawn and he names the sky his own. So he's thinking of these winds that he can just float through. He's thinking of these fat worms that he or she can eat if it were free. Okay? Everybody get that, understand that? Can you add, can you say the question again? What was the question? Um, what does the case bird, oh, of what does the free bird in the Angelo poem think? I think that Angela's he has hope. Hope? He's yeah. hopeful that maybe he can break free. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Break free to get those good old worms that he would so like to seek his mouth into. Okay, five, according to Dickinson's poem, what happens when we are asked to rise to an occasion? Now, this is Dickinson's poem. What happens when we're asked to rise up and, and just get on stage and just tell what we want to, you know, what we think, or get that nomination for president, or, you know, what, what would, it, what is she, what is, what happens, according to her, when we're asked to rise up? To go beyond what we're asked. We what? We go beyond what we're asked to do. Sometimes we do. We go beyond that expectation. Okay. But sometimes we have to be asked. We have to be told, don't we? We don't just do it. <laughs> so sometimes we go beyond what we're asked to do on those certain occasions. Yes. You know, to get that. Okay. Sometimes we, sometimes we're asked and, you know, we cower down because we don't have that confidence in ourselves. Okay. Um, like here it says, the heroes and we recite would be a normal thing. You know, we, we talk about what we want to do in these dreams that we want to, to, you know, to meet, but in these challenges that we want to do, but sometimes we just don't have what it, you know, the confidence there to be to get to where we want to in our dreams. We fear that king. That means, you know, we fear that, you know, that dominant, dominance in our lives. Those are those intimidators, so to speak. Okay. But if we plan it, if we, re if we plan it out, we, we set those goals, a lot of times we're more often we'll go beyond those challenges. Okay. Okay. Um, these are all the, the critical thinking questions are all kind of going back to the, the previous poems and um, kind of a, an analysis, a review to see uh, your comprehension level there. So the cage bird uh, symbolizes or represents in Dunbar's poem. What's the cage bird symbolized there? Am I remember? Dunbar had the sympathy poem. So he wanted you to be more sympathetic of, of those who are in what? Cages. Cages like slavery or those who are uh, discriminated against. Okay. So more or less, that's what um, Dunbar is, is actually kind of symbolizing there in his poem, like, you know, how it feels to be caged up like a slave or just to be discriminated against because of who you are, or who you represent. Okay. Um, compare and contrast the bird images. Um, we discussed that between uh, the sympathy poem and the caged bird. Um, in Dunbar's poem, I discuss that you know he's a little bit uh, brutal. Um, he he gives those images of of the brutality of being in a cage and and, and breaking his wings and the blood, where Angelo is more on the positive. Um, she she kind of gives you know how it is to be free and gives those images of freedom and if we could only see and, and, and meet those, uh, and lose those restraints of discrimination and prejudices and biases, then, you know, that's what it feels like. So it's a little bit different on the, like I said, the perspectives there. Does Dickinson feel that people are capable of acting better than they do? 
or that they do not give themselves credit for the good things they actually accomplish. This is where she talks about where she, we kind of can infer that, you know, sometimes we just don't have that confidence in ourselves. So, you know, we know that we can do great things. And we, maybe we've accomplished great things, but we still feel like we don't, we didn't do enough or we're not good enough. Do you guys ever feel that way? You know, you, you might have, uh, you might be the one that you're, that your classmates come to on a, on a math assignment because, you know, they know that you know the concepts pretty well, but you yourself may be like, you know, you're always the one that's like before a test, it's like, oh, I'm so nervous. I don't know. I can't do this. I'm just, I'm, you're sweating just because, you know, you just don't feel like you're capable of doing those great things. So, and that's kind of what she's talking about there. Explain how human beings could be equivalent of a cage bird or a free bird. Okay, that's kind of on your own too. Like how, you know, explain in your own experiences how human beings are equivalent of, you know, being a cage or free, you know. And that's talking about all the, you know, the different inequality issues that we have, okay, in the world. So, any questions on those? Is Dickinson more likely to see people as cage birds or free birds? Anybody have, a, have one for that one? Free birds. Free birds. Anybody else? I think, a, I think on that one, I mean, that's just my opinion, you know, she, she feels like, you know, that when she talks about, they fear the king right here. Yeah, we know we can, we, we know we can do these things, but we have this cubit's warp, okay, this bent out emotional state that we don't really feel like we are capable of it when we are because we fear that king and that and that's where that where you know maybe she does feel like we're caged up because we lack the confidence to go out there and meet our dreams okay so if you look at that perspective you know that's kind of where she's coming from we fear greatness we fear those things that we could do just because we don't think we're capable of it in our own state of minds. So that's where that confidence in ourselves is huge. Okay. Um, Loving what lines in Dickinson's poems indicate the main idea? Did everybody catch that one? The main idea of this poem, everybody know what it is? If you looked at those first two lines, we never know how high we are till we are asked to rise, okay? So if I asked you to get up and I want you to, you know this, uh, like, like some of you knew, like I can say, maybe some of you are into car racing, okay? And you know about everything, you know about the drivers, you know about the, you know, the tracks, and I mean, you know everything, that, you know, because we've had these discussions, right? So I'm just like, hey, would you get up here and speak in front of the class because we got a story coming up about that has to do with this. Would you just get up there and talk about it? What do you do? As a student, you're like, uh, no, uh, absolutely never, no, not in, no. You couldn't pay me enough. You couldn't feed me enough food. <laughs> so I know you guys would be that way. So now some of you are like, Gotcha. I'm up there, man. So those first two lines are really signifying of the entire poem because it's all talking about how when we, you know, we have this confidence, we have this, you know, heroic, you know, things that we've done, but we just don't think it's normal. We don't think that we, we can do 
what others can sometimes. So we fear that freedom. Okay, the other ones are more or less review of uh, the figurative language, language that we've uh, discussed in your notes. So questions, good? Okay, all right, I'm going to go on. Anybody want a shout out? Anything else? All right, going back, um, so the notes uh, you guys and I put on here for you guys. Um, all right, you had some, some words here, all right, um, that, uh, that you're going to have to, you're gonna have to know a little bit about, okay, um, as you read the next poem. And the poem is actually, uh, gotta go back. Okay, so this post, uh, oh, you guys make sure that you've cleaned up, everything's submitted on those four poems, okay, for that, those assignments and you'll get a updated grade. Most of you, if you did not finish that last poem, then uh, make sure you just submit that and I'll update your grade, okay? Okay, so this is the one, it says week three, an obstacle and TED talk. It's the one I just posted sometime or other. Okay, so for this one, you have, All right, the poem was posted, okay, for you. And um, this one's by Charlotte Gilman. She was a, a writer back in the day. And I can't get rid of this. Okay. There we go. All right, she was uh, best known for short stories. Um, she uh, had several poetry collections as well. Um, she was a female writist, uh, a writer. Um, she was kind of in that feminist mo movement there. So since we're going on with the theme of equality, inequality, prejudices, and things like that, I, just, I looked at this poem and Kind of, and there's a poem here, and then as you notice on the um, the post, there's also a, a TED Talk, okay? I know all of you have had to endure some of those TED Talks. This is pretty good. Michael Kimmel's a pretty good, uh, he's got a lot of humor um, within his talk, so of course that helps a lot, in, in my view anyway. Maybe not in your view, but in my view, I like humor. So... And it's the theme that he discusses is um, actually kind of a sidekick of the obstacle of what um, of what Charlotte Gilman discusses in the obstacle. So that's why I created these posts, these uh, two together. So when you go get to the um, actual assignment on this, the the last few questions will will deal with the TED talk, and it'll be a little bit of um, questions on comparing, you know, why, did, how does this compare to what um, uh, what Gilman is referring to it in the obstacle? How is this, you know, what it, how is it similar? How is it contrasting in any way? Um, but you're also going to be listening to that and uh, finding some some other answers of what he uh, is actually discussing about um, gender equality. Okay, so. Going back to this. Okay. So an obstacle, everybody there. And I'm gonna just go through and read it and discuss a little bit um, 
about um, some of the terms and things within this. So if I lose you, you know, I'm, then I'm going to ask you, of course, to go back and answer the questions on your own. But, okay. Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to do. Okay. It's called an obstacle. I was climb, climbing up a mountain path with many things to do. Important business of my own and other people's too. When I ran against a prejudice that quite cut off the view. Okay, so this, we got this stanza and we got this lady, she's running around, she's got all these things to do. Um, she's got other people's things to do too. She's, she's stressed, she's like overwhelmed. And then she runs against prejudice, okay? Now prejudice in this figuratively is a little bit intimidating, okay? And knowing that this, she wrote in the feminist movement, she wanted equality for, for women, you can probably infer that she's, you know, in, she's referring to the man in this case, okay? All right. So this man came into view and cut off. She just, he just like stood in front of her like, I, I'm not letting you get anything done. I'm here. Sorry. Can't do much. I'm in front of you. Okay. So second stanza. My work was such as could not wait. My path quite clearly showed. My strength and time were limited. I carried quite a load. And there that hulking prejudice sat all across the road. So there he is. Prejudice is just sitting there. Won't let her pass. Won't let her get any things done. Won't let her get her ideas across. Won't let her, you know, do her job, okay? That she so wants to do. It's just sitting there, just like a hulking man. Well, it's just cut, cutting her off. So here she goes. She's going to go and she's got an idea. So I'm going to speak to him politely. For he was huge and high and begged that he would move a bit and let me travel by. He smiled. But as for moving, he didn't even try. Okay, so that idea didn't even work. She tried to speak to him politely. He's like, eh, you know, I just, I just really would like to get my things done and get my, you know, my ideas heard. You know, I, you know, and some of my things are really good. I mean, I, I would really love to, you know, for you to listen. But no, he just smiled at her. Eh, I'm good. Sorry. So she has her next little idea here. She says, and then I re reasoned quietly with that colossal mule. Notice all these words that signifying that this, this person or this prejudice is just huge. It's surmounting. My time was short, no other path. The mountain winds were cool. I argued like a Solomon. He sat there like a fool. So when it says like a Solomon, it's very like a wise person, okay? You know, like she's debating, arguing like a Solomon, but he sat there like a fool. Still didn't budge. Then I flew into passion. I danced and howled and swore. I pelted and blabbered, but till I was stiff and sore. He got as mad as I did, but he sat there as before. So it didn't help. She got all mad and started dancing around and, and swearing and Throwing stuff at him, but and he did. He, and then he did the same thing. Ah! And he didn't. And then he just sat there. Okay, so that didn't do any good. So the next, she says, and then I begged him on my knees. I might be kneeling still. If so, I hope to move that mass of obdurate ill will as well. Invite the monument to vacate Bunker Hill. So I sat before him helpless. Oh, that ended there on that stanza. Okay, so what she's done, she's, she's kneeling, she's begging now, okay? She's begging, that, please, please just listen to my idea. I, I beg you, I, I'm, I really have some great, I, I would love to help you. I would love to, you know, 
help our company and get, get my ideas across. But this prejudice is just like, he's very stubborn. Obdurate means like stubborn. And he just sat there like this huge monument, this huge statue that's on Bunker Hill. Of course, that's a big battle site. And they got a big statue that's huge. You're not gonna move it. It's just sitting there, okay? So that's where she's at now. Like, uh, now what do I do? So I sat before him helpless in an ecstasy of woe. The mountain mists were rising fast. The sun was sinking slow. When a sudden inspiration came, as sudden winds do blow. Okay, so now she's like, oh, I'm helpless. I don't know what to do. She's thinking. She's, she's brainstorming. And then finally, an inspiration came. All right, I got this. I took my hat. I took my stick. My load, I settled there. I approached that awful incubus. Incubus is like a person that just didn't care for women back in the day with an absent-minded air. So she just kind of like ignored, ignored him. And I walked directly through him as if he wasn't there. Oh. So she finally figured out like, if I just don't let him bother me, or if I don't let this prejudice, whatever it might be, bother me and get to me, and I just go on with my dreams, and I just go on with my ideas, maybe I can just break free and just go with it and do what I can. And that's all I can do. Just do what I can to just but ignore these prejudices and these discrimination issues in front of me and just go and just be bold and brave and break through. Just ignore it. Okay. And that's what she did. All right. So still going on with that theme a little bit on, you know, those limitations that we have because we lack the confidence or we feel we're being discriminated against and all these issues still going along correlating with that theme guys. Okay. And each stanza there's, you know, something else that goes, goes about with this. So you guys um, on your assignment here, I would go ahead and answer these uh, questions based on the poem the best that you can. Okay, it's talking about the, the setting. Okay. Um, the setting of the poem is very, very important. It's talking about um, the mountains, um, how um, if you go back, it says I was climbing up a mountain path. You know how you always have to climb and climb and, and go through these obstacles in life to, to uh, you know, get things done. You know, you guys fight these obstacles all the time. You fight uh, friends, you know, the drama that you have, coaches, teachers, you know, your, your parents. I mean, there's all kinds of obstacles and things that we have to, all, we're always on a climbing journey and, and to, in life. We're always climbing, you know, trying to find our dreams and find ourselves. And that's kind of where that setting um, right, is identified there. Okay, first thing. So how does it contribute to the theme there? Anybody have an idea? The winding path implies the speaker is lost. She's not really lost, is she? I think it might be B, maybe. Speaker climbs a mountain path, which suggests an upward struggle. Thus, the setting underscores the simple theme of resilience in the face of adversity. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Good job. She's facing a lot of adversity because she's feeling like she's being discriminated against. Okay. So she's got that struggle. It's upward struggle. Like everybody else, we all face those struggles in life. And that's kind of what she's experiencing. Okay. All right. So go through the questions. Um, this one's going to ask you to summarize. Um, you look at what I did for you guys when I read the poem. I kind of looked at each stanza and offered some, uh, a little bit of summary on what's going on. And what I want you guys to do is just kind of look, okay, what's going on and what's going on in the, you know, what'd she do first? First she was polite. Okay. You know, 
And then she got, she tried to reason, right? She tried to reason through things. And, and then she's like, ah, she's getting all crazy and, and starts arguing and, and, you know, yelling out different things. That didn't help. And then finally she, she just kind of, and oh, she begs. Don't forget the begging stage there. <laughs> and then finally she reasons through and she, she brainstorms of what's best to do. And she comes to the notion that she just needs to ignore it and do what she feels is right. Okay. So that's a kind of a summary there. Just, you're just looking at, you know, summarizing three or four of those stands of what the main idea is. So. Okay. And the other ones are, are multiple choice. Um, you have to what's best supporting and then what's the best evidence there to support the, the question there. Okay, point of view. Um, I hope I answered, I mean, I talked and discussed uh, enough to give you a good uh, place for what you, you know, where you need to be on these questions and answers. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Obdurate, make, su make sure you, you replace these, you know, replace these words. You still don't know what, and you can look it up. I don't care. It's your, you're good. But easy to go back and, and just replace these words for obdurate and within your obdurate and your, um, within the poem. The figurative language, of course, has to do with this prejudice. And we're, we're actually, this prejudice is actually given, isn't it given human qualities? He's sitting in front of him like a towering mountain, a hulk. So what kind of figurative device is used there? And then I want you to give me an example. And how does this figurative language contribute to the poem's message? Okay, so you're trying your best on this, um, on these questions, what you have questions over. Uh, please just make me aware of those questions, guys. This TED Talk is, uh, is I want you to go through and listen to it. Make sure you at least listen to about 11 minutes of it um, because that's going to, really be able to answer these questions. You gotta listen to at least that much of it. Um, he's a good speaker. I think you will, um, well, I mean, I hope you'll enjoy him. I'm not much, I have to really be interested in TED Talks because some of them are really boring. So, but this one's pretty good. So, he's got, he's got some humor. Um, so listen to him and see if you can answer these questions about that. And I want to talk a little bit more about that next week, but I want you to get through as much as you can. Please ask me questions, email me, or, you know, put it on the classroom of things you might, um, concerns. And this is, of course, is one of the, your own questions, number 14. So. All right, guys. Anything we need to discuss? Yell out. All right. Well, I'll see you guys next week and have a great week.